This is the third and final piece of the introduction to American culture in the 19th century um, for the first week of our class. And just finishing up talking a little bit about the Hudson River School and some of the issues that they're raising. I just wanted to quote from Thomas Cole's essay on American scenery from 1836. And you get a sense here of how he's really attempting to define a specific American culture, character, and landscape. It was my intention to attempt a description of several districts remarkable for their picturesqueness and truly American character, but I fear to trespass longer on your time and patience. Yet I cannot but express my sorrow that the beauty of such landscapes are quickly passing away, the ravages of the axe are daily increasing, the most noble scenes are made desolate and oftentimes with a wantonness and barbarism scarcely credible in a civilized nation. The wayside is becoming shadeless and another generation will behold spots, now rife with beauty, desecrated by what is called improvement, which as yet generally destroys nature's beauty without substituting that of art. This is a regret rather than a complaint such as the road society has to travel. It may lead to refinement in the end, but the traveler who sees the place of rest close at hand dislikes the road that has so many unnecessary windings. I will now conclude in the hope that, though feebly urged, the importance of cultivating a taste for scenery will not be forgotten. Nature has spread for us a rich and delightful banquet. Shall we turn from it? We are still in Eden. The wall that shuts us out of the garden is our own ignorance and folly. And this is a really profound and provocative passage. Um, he's saying that American scenery, such as it is, the Catskills, Mount Desert, these rugged natural places, are really and truly American in their character. And he also laments the fact that with mechanization and industrialization and the growth of the market economy in this period, that some of these places are in danger of disappearing. And he laments that, right, that this improvement is not necessarily credible in a civilized nation in the sense that, you know, people are cutting down the forest to sell the lumber. This is what's happening in, in Maine at the time. Um, and is that the right thing to do? And so he's urging conservation and preservation, even in the face of industrialization and expansion. And this becomes an important part, the part of the culture as well. But this notion of cultivating a sense and a taste for scenery is really important to American culture in this time period, especially refined culture in some ways, that there is a way to experience nature, there's a way to look at the landscape and the scenery and appreciate it. And here you have another Eastman Johnson painting. This is a boy in the Maine woods in 1868. And you can see here exactly what Cole's talking about. This rugged natural landscape where the, where the boy is walking is, is more desolate now. It's a forest that's decimated by the search for capital in these natural resources. And, it, and it's a warning in many ways as well. And it's interesting because you can also look at some very characteristic depictions of American scenery from the time, like this one of Lowell, Massachusetts. This is the East View of Lowell. Lowell is one of the nation's first specifically built factory towns on the Merrimack River. Um, and the Concord and the Merrimack River come together here, which made it an ideal place for textile mills that needed to be powered by this convergence of the rivers. Um, but you see here a really peaceful, organized, town, still rural in some ways across the river, um, but it's not the true sense of what factories would do to these natural landscapes. If you look at another one from Lowell in 1850, again, neat, orderly, factory town. People are sort of looking at it across the river. You even have an artist in the bottom left-hand corner sketching that you can see here, uh, and these people walking around and even the dog running around. It all looks very rural and pastoral. And oh, there's the factory in the distance, but what's missing? Where's the smoke? Where's the noise? And where are the people who make this whole um, enterprise even remotely possible? Uh, a little bit more realistic is Winslow Homer's depiction of New England factory life, Bell Time, from Harper's Weekly in July 1868. And you see the workers with their lunch pail, old, young, men, women, children, immigrants, natives, 
all making their way to the imposing factory on the river which will house them for the next um, day as they go and to make and to sell these wares. And I also want to leave you with this image and it's an interesting one from a school book in 1856 called The Youth's Manual of Geography by James Monteith. And I also want you to think about school books and textbooks as a way of gauging cultural shifts because you see cultural shifts quite a bit as you look through textbooks from the past. But here in 1856 you see technology being highlighted, the locomotive, the telegraph, and the steamship, all new ways of transmitting goods and people and culture in a way too and speeding up a society and industrializing a society and making possible a faster pace of life than was ever even thought possible in Jefferson's time, right? These inventions really begin to spark new innovations and also new forms of culture and cultural transmission. Technology is incredibly important in an understanding of culture. Um, and you see here ship um, Fitzhugh Lane, also another Hudson River School member, his shipping in Down East Waters in 1850. But as the 19th century wore on to get these kind of rugged, natural, untouched landscape views, you had to actually go further and further west. And so you, then you get painters like Albert Bierstadt painting the Rocky Mountains, Landers Peak in 1863, where again we see um, Native American tribes in this really untouched and unspoiled landscape, which becomes a very different scene from the one you'll see later in the 19th century during the end of the Indian Wars. And the Sierras near Lake Tahoe in California in 1865, again, these sublime landscapes populated with nature that are really drawing people in, that are really inviting them to consume this landscape too, to travel west, away from the industrialized east, back into this wide open, particularly American landscape. And you can see it here with Bierstadt's Chimney Rock. But what these paintings don't depict, but what you're very well familiar with, is that this drive west, this push west, this expansion west, makes the lives of the very people depicted in these paintings, the Native Americans, it changes their entire culture by pushing them out, by pushing them onto the reservation, by killing the buffalo, by making this white civilization possible they work to destroy another culture, which is a story obviously for another time, but one that has to be kept in mind. Two more things to think about when you're thinking about the onset of 19th century American culture. The notion of Jacksonian democracy, really defined by President Andrew Jackson. This is a broadside, another important form of cultural dissemination, information dissemination in, in the early 19th century. This is a campaign poster for Jackson's 1828 presidential campaign. Jackson forever, the hero of two wars in New Orleans, battle um, 1814, war of 1812, man of the people. Um, the presidency should be derived from the people, old hickory. And so he's really looking for a democracy that's more common, right? That's not just defined by people with who own a lot of property and who have a lot of money, but expanding this notion of universal male suffrage, right? To get rid of some property requirements to vote. Jackson wants to be the president of the people. He wants to be known as the people's president. He believes in the popular vote. He wanted to be the president for the common man. He was brought up in poverty in rural Tennessee. He was a champion of the ordinary citizen and not of the powerful elite. And it's no coincidence, and I just mentioned this here, it's no coincidence that American popular culture uh, through Barnum, through Brady and others that we'll talk about next week is really born during this time period of Jackson's presidency beginning with his win of the election of 1828 because this is really an emphasis on the common man and common culture. You can even see this at his inaugural celebration. This is a political cartoon from 1829, the president's levy of all creation going to the White House. So you can see masses of people funneling into the White House. It was, by all accounts, a unbelievable crowded scene. It got so bad in there that Andrew Jackson actually had to escape through a window for fear of being crushed at his own inaugural celebration. 
but this is what you get of sort of inviting the people and celebrating the common man. And the final thing to think about is the onset of the market revolution in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and 50s as well, which is a huge economic shift in America where we move largely from a subsistence economy of small farms and tiny workshops where local needs were satisfied through barter and exchange to a market economy where farmers and manufacturers specialize. They produce food and goods for distant markets and cash rewards. And with the market revolution, individuals are free to profit from producing and selling goods in this freedom for profit in the production and sale of goods is incredibly important to the origins of early American popular culture. And the consequences of the spread of the market are really tied to cultural exchange as well. Western expansion, urbanization, the transformation of labor relationships, contractual society, mobility, anonymity, changing living standards, a notion of the modern family and the modern selfhood, all of these things which grow from the market revolution are also incredibly important to understanding popular culture at this time as well. And so that ends our sort of discussion of culture at this point. And I hope this helps you get ready um, for your readings this week, gives you a little bit of background and fosters a kind of greater understanding of the time period and the birth of American cult popular culture in this period. And your readings this week and next week will add a lot to this understanding as well. So I really am interested to see what you have to say about it. Till next week.